Yeah. <clears throat> I was interested in how you computed um, the developmental progression. I think there's probably different ways in which you could, you know, sort of establish what the progression is. Mm -hmm. So you could compare each of them against chance, and once they differ, differ significantly for another differ from chance, you could say, oh, that one comes first. You could also compare them amongst each other. I was just curious how, how you determined uh, the progression. Um, so the initial pass was we just took a raw percentage performance. So uh, so the in the whole group of children, we looked at which task had the highest percentage getting it correct, and then which task had the second highest percentage, and so forth. Um, and so we were comparing, in a sense, against each other. Um, we did look at individually uh, in the individual task, comparing uh, sort of across two tasks whether or not they perform better on one task versus another. And um, in terms of being able to tell whether or not they are, um, in a sense, developing individual level progression where I talked about if you pass a task, you fail all of them or uh, pass all of them. Um, and for that, we did a government analysis, which um, in a sense is a scaling measure that forces it to adhere to this uh, particular progression. And if it doesn't adhere to that, it doesn't sort of reach reliability for that. Yeah. So I, I don't have a lot of confidence in this competing hypothesis, but let me put it out there as a uh -huh. possibility. So you suggested that the sequence is a function of there being different constituent mechanisms or maybe even completely separate mechanisms, but maybe the difference is either input or um, the salience assigned to input. And it's all one mechanism. Okay. So for example, one might think that diversity of desires is um, something that children encounter fairly, fairly early, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's much more sort of heterogeneity of tastes, um, particularly with regard to something like food, for example, which children learn about very early on. Adults like some things that children right. don't like, and so on, right? Uh, then there is necessarily about something like false belief, right? right. Um, the number of situations in which they would encounter the former is probably greater than the number of situations in which they encounter the latter. So. Um, if it's all being processed by an underlying mechanism, but there's some sort of expertise effect that comes with experience, then you get what looks like a developmental sequence um, <coughs> when it's really just a, a frequency of exposure. Right. Um, so actually, I have been thinking following along that line. So um, so it is, or at least my hypothesis, as you, your hypothesis, is that in life we encounter diversity or contrast in desires much more than we um, encounter at least explicitly um, sort of public contrast of uh, thoughts. And um, especially for children where they're um, at a young age consistently dealt with where they want to go to the right and the parent says no, go to the left. Um, or they want this thing, this food, and the parent says no, you get this food. So they're constantly uh, confronted with this uh, um, contrast. So. But what I would, uh, well, one thing is I have been dealing with that, and in fact I've been designing studies that is exactly trying to show that that's the case. So um, I'm doing a study where I'm uh, presenting or teaching children novel verbs, and um, in one case I teach the novel verb to be, um, in a sense, Steve Blickett A and Bob Blickett B, or and Bob Blickett A versus uh, Steve Blickett A, but Bob Blickett B. So in the second case, you would perhaps assume that Blickett would be a, a desire verb, whereas in the former case, because you get shared um, sort of Blicketness, you would assume it to be a belief verb. And the question is, when you present that to children, um, whether or not they would think if Bob doesn't get Blickett uh, or Bob Wicket's A and doesn't get it, would Bob be surprised or would Bob be sad? So, um, in fact, that is sort of something that I want to study, and in fact, I agree with that. Um, but I would say that that doesn't actually counter what I'm saying, and that that simply says where is it that what type of learning that they're using in order to come up with, the, with these different mechanisms. Um, and I think what makes it difficult and why we're going to the ERP data is is that when you have different types of learning, you could all uh, sort of converge on a single system or it could converge on multiple systems. 
And so that's one of the main reasons why we're hoping with the ERP data that we're able to then look at it. If there are different components, then that would suggest different uh, systems being involved. Just a, a short follow-up to that. You can, I mean, you can conceivably extend that explanation to account for the cross-cultural differences. If there, are, there's cultural variation in the sort of salience of different kinds of tasks, right? Right. So um, I, I can't remember what the exact sequence was, but you know, if getting everyone to agree is more important in a given place than getting everyone to share the same sentiments or getting everyone to uh, know the same things, right? That is, people may just say, "Yes, I'll go along with whatever other people want," even if I don't actually know what their internal states are. That could make a big difference mm -hmm. in terms of um, uh, the the facility with which children acquire thinking about other stuff. Yeah, and in fact, that's where we're going for the Chinese data, where um, where we're we're doing exactly that, where we think perhaps diversity of belief is less adhered to, whereas knowledge. Uh, for example, in uh, Chinese uh, uh, teachings, they're much more sort of talked about or uh, sort of pushed for knowing how to do things. So uh, perhaps that sort of increases the salience of knowledge, whereas they might be um, sort of the salience for uh, sort of disagreements might be pushed uh, aside. And so um, I think, in fact, you're um, not, or at least I agree with everything you said. and. Um, I do think that a lot of this comes from different uh, types of learning or different inputs that they're learning from. Um, but the question then is, does that learning feed into uh, a single system or a multiple system? And in fact, as of right now, I don't know exactly what the answer is. The only data I have suggested that is perhaps comp component systems is the ERP data. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Just a question to go maybe even a little more basic about the idea of predicting sequences of action mm -hmm. um, where you can derive from that intention. Uh, and I wonder across species um, if we know about that, about how animals can go from seeing a sequence of actions that they may predict and then infer what the subjective mental intention is of the being that's carrying out the sequence. And I bring that up just because of the issue of the is the superior temporal area mm -hmm. of the brain has been attributed to biological motion right. versus inanimate motion. And inherent in that finding is the idea that a biological creature might have an attention where the rock tumbling down wouldn't. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, a number of points. Um, I, I don't do the sort of fine tune uh, anatomical work, but um, at least uh, what Rebecca Sachs has argued is that the area that she's talking about is actually distinct from the biological motion areas. Mm -hmm. um, so she has done a, a few studies um, that suggest that they are close to each other, but actually very distinct from each other. Um, in those studies, though, she uses very different types of tasks for them. So um, one might sort of want to see more of that study to be certain of that. Um, but indeed, one has to process biological motion in order to uh, then uh, infer and attribute the underlying mental state. So uh, there are a number of studies which suggest that, uh, that non-human primates and other animals do process biological motion. They seem to at least also automatically process eye gaze. Um, the question is whether or not they interpret um, or attribute mental states behind those eye gaze or whether or not it's more of a reflexive uh, processing. And um, in terms of those sort of most study non-human animal is with chimpanzees, um, the current argument by the Tomasella group, which unfortunately there aren't a whole lot of people doing these studies, so there's, you can only sort of attribute it to one lab or two labs. Um, but their current argument is that uh, chimpanzees do understand something about seeing. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, I've been talking, or I have long been talking to them about looking at some of the lower end tasks that I have to see whether or not chimpanzees would understand those. But um, it seems to be they have tried, but haven't been able to come up with a good way to actually uh, study diverse desire in chimpanzees. So, um, so that's unknown yet. Yeah. 
Um, I was thinking of perhaps an alternate explanation or, or an explanation period for yeah. the lag in, among children in Hong Kong. Um, isn't it the case that in Hong Kong, Cantonese is the native language, mm -hmm. but it may be possible that in the schools, Mandarin is the language of instruction or English, so it might be a language? Yeah, no. Um, can you with some of your other ideas? I think? Uh, the the school primarily schooling is in Cantonese also really? in Hong Kong in Hong Kong. Okay. Um, so, in <laughs> fact, um, I don't know what it was before Britain gave up Hong Kong, but um, they're actually not a very bilingual uh, society. So um, they they're primarily a Cantonese uh, speaking culture. Okay, All right. thank you. Um, is there any indication that? Um, that the scores on these tests, um, not the order of progression, but the, the timing of progression, is related to things that are more subtle than autism, like variation in attachment or variation in intelligence, or some some dimensions of how connected um, an individual toddler is to the right. Um, for there was a sort of slight flare up of interest in looking at attachment in theory of mind um, about a decade ago. And uh, unfortunately, that didn't come to fruition. So they didn't find any differences with different attachment classifications and performances on these things. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, so performance on any of these tasks are associated with just raw verbal mental age and um, and intelligence uh, measures. But um, in comparing across these groups, what our studies and other studies have done is try to match them on IQ uh, on certain dimensions that we think are important. So um, to the extent that controlling for that um, accounts for it, it doesn't seem to be that it's simply a intelligence difference, say, for why autistic children perform poorly. On these tasks. Yeah, uh, if there were any data on how connected socially a child is, I mean, I said okay. attachment, but but just children vary in how social engagement, yeah. and how individual, how much time they play alone, um, and how much they see social contact. Well, um, well, well, definitely uh, they are related, but the question is, it's unclear what direction of causality mm -hmm. it is, whether or not. Well, it's the um, lack of social understanding that leads to lack of social attachment or social closeness. So indeed, um, children with autism also don't seem to be particularly interested in people. Um, but the question is, is that in itself a different uh, a, a, a feature of autism or is it a consequence of them not having social understanding which makes them uninterested in people? Or could it actually some people hypothesize the other way around which is it's this lack of interest in people which leads to lack of learning about social understanding. Yeah. So um, the question of um, cross-cultural differences or, or individual differences um, within a culture in how fast these things develop. Mm -hmm. um, um, you didn't talk too much about why you thought that might be, but I know that you've done some interesting work looking at Chinese and how there's possibly linguistic effects right. of mental state terms, mm -hmm. um, for example, having false belief or true belief marked specific right. words in the language, that that might give a boost to development of um, belief understanding. Right. Could you maybe mention what you think might be some of the factors? Um, so um, specifically with the uh, different types of mental state verbs, um, some languages mark, so for example, in English, we don't particularly mark the, the valence of a particular uh, mental state verb. So when we say, although we still somewhat do, right? so when we say Bob thinks something is the case versus Bob believes something is the case, there's some slight confidence judgment being uh, provided there. But um, in Mandarin and in Cantonese, they actually have ex explicitly um, Bob uh, thinks falsely that something is the case. Um, and so we went into it thinking initially that having those verbs might actually sort of make it much more salient for children to learn about these concepts. But what we found was that um, that they didn't seem to benefit overall from having these verbs. 
but they do benefit when you actually use those verbs to ask the questions. Um, so it seems to be a very local effect where um, when you're actually asking the question, they say, oh, okay, I get it. I, this is what you're trying to ask me. Um, but when you ask them in a more neutral verb, they still don't seem to uh, understand. Um, but beyond that, there are a number of individual differences that could vary across culture or within culture. Um, so for example, sibling size seems to um, make a difference. Um, a number of other things like language abilities and inhibitory control abilities seem to um, make a difference. Um, for example, um, Mark Seba uh, did a study where he found that Chinese children actually um, are much more advanced in, exec in uh, executive control, inhibitory control than American children. So um, this is not surprising for anybody who has gone to a, a school in China versus a school in North America where uh, even a four-year-old in a preschool in China are sitting quietly at a desk and doing their work, whereas here they're jumping off the wall. Um, so not surprisingly, they're much more able to uh, pass executive control tasks. But what he found was that, uh, again, even though they were much better at that, they weren't much better on these theory of mind tasks. Um, so it becomes difficult, um, and even just beyond sort of knowing the factors, there are, there are some, some child passes a certain task and you're ahead of another child, um, but there hasn't been any um, sort of whopping differences in their sort of social lives. So it isn't the case that kids who pass, say, the false belief task a year ahead of another child has so much more friends or does so much better on the playground. Um, and so uh, the individual differences, at least within the typical range, don't seem to make that much of a difference in the social lives. The court of the, um, those studies have not been really follow up on. They're sort of anecdotal studies that have been done. Um, but, it, but we know sort of in the extreme case with autism that it does make a big impact on their lives. Wasn't there, um, didn't Barch and Wellman find that, that there was an effect of how much mental state language the child was exposed to? Right. In, the, in, in, in their sort of, how advanced they were their development yeah. was. Yeah. Um, has there been, so there's, I mean, there's availability of certain words in the language, but then there might be overall amount of exposure. Of exposure. And have, have, has there been follow up where that might be a cross cultural difference, given that people? might um, different cultures might differ in how in overall how to interaction with children and how right. language uses them. Um, not that I know of there hasn't been actual comparison on the number or the uh, exposure of mental state verbs across cultures um, what we do know is that um, in China, children learn verbs at a much higher rate than children in uh, North America. So um, North American children tend to learn majority nouns, whereas Chinese children learn about half nouns, half verbs. Um, but that doesn't really tell us whether or not those verbs increase the rate which they're exposed to mental state verbs. Yeah. Can you go back to your slides with the ERP data? So. Go to the one before that. Okay. Yeah, so I just have a lot of questions actually about how much you could conclude from, from this slide. Yeah. Say, so, I mean, a number of issues to my mind come up. So you have two arrows here that are, you know, presented to support the claim that we have differentiation of one sort in the medial frontal region and mm -hmm. differentiation of another sort in the temporal cryo region, but these structures are deep, right? Right. And you're only um, recording from the surface of the scalp, so that's A. Mm -hmm. uh, B, I'm not sure what you would even predict here. Um, you have a rise here and a fall there. We're seeing out of presumably 128 channels, nine. Um, you would also want to see lots of other channels to see if the differentiation is found in other regions, at least uh, at the scalp. So right. I'm just wondering, how deep this analysis goes, uh, literally and figuratively? Um, so, um, some people 
um, like to talk about uh, source localization with ERP research, um, I'm actually not one who does. So I'm, I'm careful, I think, to talk about it in broad strokes in terms of the localization of it on the scalp. And what I'm primarily interested in is finding differentiations between different conditions. Um, I am presuming that um, the medial prefrontal uh, and the right posterior are not coming from the same source because they're not being differentiated from the same um, sets of uh, conditions. But uh, I'm actually not making any claims about where it is neuroanatomically. Uh, I'm just saying that they're different and at different Aren't those locations. Right there? Um, these are uh, these are labels for where it is on the scalp, not for where it is. Um, so, for example, I talk about it in terms of po right posterior rather than right parietal, for example. Um, so, uh, so, so one can do source localization analysis with these and try to get a better point, but. Um, source localization is an inferential process, so one doesn't uh, know necessarily uh, whether that's accurate. Um, as for uh, looking at a bunch of uh, channels, uh, there were 128 channels, and uh, we did uh, look at them, and uh, what is typically done with um, our research, which is not necessarily interested in localization is to find representational uh, channels. So we simply uh, present a, a spectrum or a set of channels to sort of show relative to each other where they are, but we're not making uh, specific claims about uh, where it is. With that, we are a little bit of, um, after time, so we've got to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you.